Hello everyone, I'm JG and welcome back to Music Forever, where today I'm bringing you uh, another installment in my kind of album catch-up series, where I just talk about some of the albums I heard this year that I didn't have a chance to give a full review to. Uh, this is the second one of these I'm doing this year. The first one was back in, I believe, early July or late June, uh, at the end of the first half of the year. And this one, of course, being at the end of December, is at the end of this year. I've already, you know, pretty much wrapped up all my reviews for albums, and now, you know, after this video, I'm moving into my year-end list. Uh, so, you know, look out for those. But more importantly, for this video today, pretty much to be, you know, talked about here in this video, the album or EP or mixtape, whatever it may be, had to have been released in 2017, and I just didn't give it a full album review. It doesn't specifically have to have been from the second half of 2017, even though the title of this video is, you know, second half of 2017. That's, you know, really, for me, that means I heard the album in the second half of 2017, and now we're reviewing it, you know, of course, in the second half of 2017. The album, EP, mixtape, wherever it may be, uh, could have been released in the first half of the year. I just maybe didn't get to it until the second half of this year. Uh, so, some, yeah, some of the picks that we have here today are, of course, um, from the first half of this year. But I think most of them actually are from the second half of the year. But I just wanted to clarify that in case you may be confused. But yeah, pretty much I'm going to go through all these, you know, things that I missed throughout the year. I just couldn't give a full review to them either because I didn't have the time to. Or I discovered them a bit after they were released. I just heard, you know, maybe heard good things about them when they were released. Didn't have a chance to check them out though, and you know, came back a couple weeks or months later uh, and gave them a full listen. Of course, I wasn't going to make a full review then. I had moved on to other things by then, but instead, you know, that's what this segment is for. I get to talk about some of those albums to some extent. Now, these aren't full album reviews or anything like that, so don't expect me to go into a ton of detail for all of these. Uh, just because that's not the point of this video. It's already going to be long enough as it is with the little segments that I have here today. So yeah, I couldn't go into all of these with a ton of detail or anything like that. Uh, so yeah, don't expect the full review or anything. I'm just sharing my thoughts on these projects with you because I thought, you know, why not really? Alright, now we're talking about uh, the most recent EP released by Matt Champion, a member of uh, the boy band Brockhampton, uh, the, who you're probably familiar with for dropping uh, their album Saturation, Saturation 2, and uh, as of me recording this video now, soon to be Saturation 3, uh, as, I'm, as of, I'm recording this, part of, by the time I upload this video, it, it'll already have been released and I'll have reviewed it already. But, you know, as I'm rec recording this right now, I haven't heard the album, it hasn't been released yet, uh, just for some context. Uh, this EP was actually dropped a couple, uh, a good while earlier into the year, uh, before the release of the Saturation albums, uh, which is why I wasn't really familiar with this EP, because I didn't get into Brockhampton until the Saturation albums were released. Uh, and this EP even still seems to kind of have gone under the radar a bit when it comes to Brockhampton fans, uh, just because it is... I, I don't know why, honestly, because it's a pretty good EP, honestly. Uh, I really like how it shows off uh, Matt's more, you know, s this more singing from Matt, I guess you could say. On the Saturation album, he's mostly rapping, uh, which, uh, he, he's a good rapper. I really like uh, his rap style that he shows off on those albums. But, you know, him singing is also something that I do really enjoy. It's not something I really got to hear him do until I heard uh, Brock Hampton's first mixtape, All American Trash, where he does do some singing there, as well as hearing some of uh, his other just individual singles that he's dropped. And speaking of some of his individual singles that he's dropped, uh, some of them appear on this EP kind of as alternate like versions, I guess you could say, uh, like Mansions, which appears here in like a shorter format, I guess you could say. And uh, there's a, a track which is kind of a demo version of his track Fangs, which was also released earlier this year in like a, a fuller version, I guess you could say. And there's a track Punks, uh, probably one of his more well-known individual tracks. And the version of that track that appears on this EP is actually longer than the single version that was dropped beforehand. And uh, I do, of course, still really like the song here like I did in its original single format. I just like the kind of, um, you know carefree feel that it has to it, and this longer version, uh, of course, has a longer kind of instrumental outro to it that I do enjoy as well. I'm not quite sure which version I prefer, uh, the single-like version or this version, but uh, uh, they're both pretty good. You can't really go wrong either way. Uh, and then there's tra some of the newer tracks here that haven't appeared in any other format, like Girl Next Door, which is uh, probably my favorite track on this thing. It's definitely a longer track, and it kind of has this sort of winding, spaced-out sort of feel to it that I really enjoy. Uh, with the guitars kind of rolling in the background. It has this sort of laid-back feel to it uh, that I do really enjoy. It is very different from uh, the material that he 
kind of does with Brockhampton, at least like on the saturation albums with his rap style and things like that. It's it's pretty different, which is something that I really like seeing here. How this EP shows a very different side of his musical ability, I guess you could say, uh, and it just really shows how diverse uh, Matt Champion kind of is as an artist uh, outside of. Brockhampton, and I know many members of the group kind of have that aspect to them if you kind of look into some of their own solo works. Uh, so this is a pretty solid EP. Uh, if you're a fan of Brockhampton and if you didn't know that this existed, uh, you should definitely check it out. It's not a very long EP, but it, it does have a lot of very good tracks on it, uh, like Girl Next Door, for example, Punks, uh, just a lot of very enjoyable, it's a very laid back kind of EP, something that you can definitely just kind of, I guess, space out to, uh, but at the same time, if you want to pay more attention to it, there's going to be a lot of stuff here that rewards you. So you should definitely check it out. Alright everyone, now we're reviewing the newest album from At The Drive-In in Terralia. Now this band, along with the Mars Volta, you know, a band that was made out of members from the, you know, this band, uh, later on, or were um, two bands that I didn't really get into until this year after this album was released. Um, lots of people, of course, I, after the release of this album, lots of people were talking about this band. Finally decided to check them out, and um, of course I ended up liking a lot of their material. So of course when I went to check out this album, I kind of expected to like it as well. And overall, while I do, you know, this album is not bad or anything, I don't know, it feels a bit, you know, what's the word I'm looking for exactly? Just a bit off, I guess you could say. Like, you know, there's some good riffs here. Um, you know, there's nothing that really stands out as being particularly bad, but it just kind of lacks the spark and just kind of, you know, the, the, the wow factor that I feel like a lot of their other material had to it, um, I guess would be the best way to put it. Uh, there are a couple tracks on here that I still, you know, really enjoy, uh, but some of the tracks, you know, the vocals kind of annoy me on some tracks, which is something I really wouldn't, you know, imagine myself saying, just given how much of a fan I am in the vocals uh, for this band on previous efforts, as well as the Mars Volta. Um, it just kind of surprised me that, you know, some of the times they ended up annoying me here on this project. Uh, and other times, you know, just some parts aren't quite as, you know, imaginative or as interesting or creative as previous projects. Overall, it's a pretty, you know, it, it's good overall, I would say, but it's, it kind of still lacks that wow factor that I kind of got while listening to some of their other material. So, you know, that's pretty much it. Alright folks, now we're talking about Roger Waters with Is This the Life That We Really Want? Or Is This the Life We Really Want? One of those two. Yeah. Uh, this album, of course, Roger Waters, former member of Pink Floyd, one of my favorite sort of classic progressive rock groups, uh, just have some albums I do really like from them. And of course, Roger Waters kind of being a big part of that band uh, when he was in the band, of course. Uh, of course, nowadays, he's not in that group, and he, this is his now solo album that he released. So what do I think about this album for the most part? Well, I, I think it's alright, to be honest. Uh, he definitely goes for, once again, a kind of progressive art rock sort of sound that is a bit reminiscent of Pink Floyd, to be honest. Uh, he's definitely not going in a completely new direction here with the music, but once again, he's kind of focusing in on a sound that he's done before, but doing so in a way that, you know, makes sense. It's not redundant, really, I would say. But it's still not, I guess you would say, the most interesting sound in the world. Lyrically, he goes for more social, political issues of the time now, which I do like to a degree, seeing artists, especially an older artist, going for these issues, which are most ha often tackled by younger artists, I feel. Uh, but once again, Roger Waters kind of shows that he's, you know, he's always been a bit more political and socially aware with his lyrics, especially, you know, even going back to Pink Floyd. Uh, and it's nice to kind of see him keep up with that in his modern lyrics as well, to show that he still kind of does care about these issues that he's talking about here. But the only thing is that I just kind of feel, like listening to this album, that I'm just kind of underwhelmed with the final product. Like, you know, it, on paper, everything is there, really. Uh, you know, it sounds nice, the lyrics are nice. Uh, the flow of the album is fantastic, by the way. That's just another thing I do want to stress. The flow of this album from start to finish is very nice. I like how we managed to have these tracks flow into one another. And the whole thing just feels very well put together, in my opinion. I do got to give props there, because it does have a very nice flow to it. However, kind of going back to what I was saying before, just kind of listening to this album, you know, on paper, it seems like an album that I would really enjoy. But the actual execution of it is just kind of eh, in my opinion. Uh, you know, it sounds nice, there are some good songs here, definitely some ones I think are worth coming back to, but there's also some tracks that are just, you know, just kind of there, to be honest. And, you know, once again, the flow of this album does really help it become a more album-like experience, definitely something that you probably would prefer to listen to from start to finish, rather than just tracks here and there, but still, 
it just doesn't exactly excite me in the same way that some past works from Roger Waters have. And despite the fact that it does have a strong sort of political and social message to it, uh, I still think that there are other artists out there maybe doing it possibly just a slight bit better. And here, it's once again, it's good, but it's not super standout in the way that this album just stands out as a whole. Overall, it just kind of feels like another sort of progressive art rock album that uh, exists, to be honest. and just kind of leaves me wanting to maybe revisit some of his other works from the past that were, you know, just a bit better, in my opinion. Overall, it's not a bad album all the way through. If you're a Roger Waters kind of fanboy of sorts, you're definitely going to enjoy this project. Even if you're like a Pink Floyd fan, this definitely is an album I think is worth checking out. But still, I just didn't think it was the most exciting thing in the world. But still good and decent for what it's worth. Alright, now we're talking about the new album from Chuck Berry, just simply entitled Chuck. Now, Chuck Berry, of course, being just a legend of rock and roll, one of the founders, I guess you could say, of that genre way back when. And now recently, of course, this year, he recently passed away just after this album was released. And which, of course, is unfortunate, though he did get to live to be rather uh, old and, of course, be just a legend in his time. So that's, of course, I guess you could say, looking back on him with... Positive memories, he did have a great influence uh, just on rock and roll and just rock music, I guess you could say, as a whole. And this, of course, is his last album then as a result of that. And it was his first release, really, in a very long time. I forgot exactly how many how years... Um, oh, well, that was not, did not come out right. Exactly how many years it's been. But uh, I'll maybe throw it up on screen here. Um, but it's been a while since we got an album or just really something from Chuck Berry or a significant amount of content to really sink your teeth into. So, you know, kind of getting this project so late into his career, I mean, very late, that is, uh, I was kind of, you know, not exactly surprised, but interested to see what he would give us. And overall, I think that this is a decent sort of rock and roll album. Now, I don't exactly listen to a ton of older sort of rock and roll material, but Chuck Berry is always someone that I'm looking forward to listening to. And here, he just provides a very solid effort. I don't think it's one of his best. I don't think it's, you know, super iconic or groundbreaking or anything like that. He's mostly just sticking for, for, forward with a kind of, you know, typical sort of rock and roll sound. In fact, there are some tracks on here that seem like they're directly related to some of his other tracks. Take the track Lady Be Good, for example, which is kind of feels like a sequel or a spiritual successor to, like, Johnny Be Good, you know, his classic song that everyone knows. It, there's just moments like that that kind of call back to older material that I really enjoyed and just kind of made this album a bit of a throwback to a degree, but at the same time it was very much new and it was very much its own personality and its own like uh, project on its own. It doesn't exactly require anything else in his past discography to really support this album. Overall, I think it's a very solid project. If you're a Chuck Berry fan, I think you'll enjoy it. But then again, if you're not really a fan of rock and roll or like, you know, this older style of music, I guess you could say, it may not be exactly suited for you, and it's definitely not his most groundbreaking or interesting project, but, you know, for this point in his career, uh, being there's such a large gap between when he released his last project and just the age that he was at, of course, it, it, overall, this is a pretty good project from him, and it's better than I would have expected someone from this time period at this age and this point in their career to be releasing. <laughs> Alright, now we're talking about the newest album from Imagine Dragons entitled Evolve. Now this is a band that I initially became aware of back when their first album dropped. Uh, if you remember, there was lots of popular songs off that album that were getting lots of radio play. And of course, that's where I became aware of the band. I happened to like a couple of the tracks from that album. I actually think it's a pretty decent album overall, I would have to say. Uh, but after that, I didn't really pay much attention to this group. I do know that they had another album drop a couple of years back. I didn't check it out. I still haven't checked it out, so I don't really know anything much about it. But when I heard that they had a new album out, I decided to check it out, really. And it's not really that all that great, I guess you could say. Uh, it's really just a painfully boring, generic, kind of pop rock album. And they've always been a more pop rock oriented group to be honest. Never they were never really a you know hard hitting rock group. But they could always make or at least back on that first album based off some of the songs I heard from that project, uh, they they had the ability to make some good pop rock tunes. And that's really, you know, absent here on this project. Lots of the tracks just kinda sound a bit annoying at worst. Tracks like Thunder, for example, come to mind. Uh, and at best lots some of these tracks are really just, you know, maybe, you know, not you know, painful to listen to or anything like that, but they're not exactly, you know, jump off the page uh, quality, you know, when it comes to memorability. And you also have tracks like uh, Yesterday, for example, which just really have these, you know, more, I guess, aggressive uh, guitar parts 
haphazardly kind of thrown in there, I guess, to kind of make this more of a, you know, rock album, quote-unquote. Uh, and, you know, like, it just, I just don't think it really works in the context of that track. And I know there's a couple other tracks on here as well that kind of do a similar thing. They'll try to throw in some, you know, rock-oriented aspect in there. It's a bit heavier uh, to make it more, I guess, authentic uh, when it comes to rock music. But it just doesn't really work, and it just makes the project sound sloppy and just unmemorable overall, I have to say. This is pretty a b pretty boring album, pretty unmemorable. Like I said, it's not probably not the worst thing you could listen to in terms of, you know, just being painful to listen to, but, you know, there are a couple cuts on here that do reach that quality, and the, the ones that don't aren't exactly good enough to bring it up to, you know, a must-check-out or something like that. Overall, it, it wasn't really my thing. Alright, now we're talking about the newest album from Uncommon NASA, Written at Night. Uh, now, Uncommon NASA was an artist I didn't really get into until this year. Uh, I decided to check him out with this project. And I have to say, this is an album that I really enjoyed. He definitely has a sound, a uh, more alternative kind of underground hip-hop sound that I do enjoy. That's primarily the style of hip-hop that I enjoy the most, I would say. Uh, so, you know, his style of music, I guess, is right up my alley. In uh, this album here, there's lots of things about it that I really enjoy. The concept of it being, you know, written at night, and, you know, as it goes through the album, it kind of goes through the different hours at night and things like that. I enjoy that concept. And the album just has a nighttime feel to it as well, uh, which I really enjoy. I just, it just feels like a nighttime album, if that makes any sense. I know it's kind of difficult to describe, but when you listen to it, it, it definitely has that sort of feel to it. You just kind of like that feeling you get at night uh, when you just can't sleep for whatever reason, and so your mind just kind of starts going through all sorts of things going on in your life, and just in the world in general. That's kind of what this album feels like, to be completely honest, because there are lots of, you know, modern social issues, po political issues, things like that, touched upon here in the lyrics of this album. And there are probably some of the best, uh, you know, instances of these issues being tackled in music that I've heard this year. They're not, you know, super on the nose to the point where they're, you know, just, you know, preachy or corny or anything like that, but at the same time they manage to get their ma message across in a very, you know, important sounding uh, and convincing manner, which I think is very important. This album has a lot of guest features on it, and I wasn't familiar with every artist featured here on the project. I typically don't like albums with lots of guest features, just because I feel like lots of times they distract from the main artist of the album and just kind of take away from what the main artist is providing. But surprisingly enough, on this album, I feel like a lot of the guest features just kind of add to the album, you know, just album's feel as a whole. Like, despite the fact that there are a lot of, you know, featured artists on here with their own unique styles and sounds, they all kind of play into this album's idea and concept uh, that's constructed by Uncommon NASA just so well. Like, I'm not exactly sure if he was, like, you know, kind of, you know, in control of, you know, what these artists were doing, but they just play so nicely into the concept of the album. Like, just the way that they're incorporated into the project. They don't sound like, you know, they're there as filler or to waste time or anything. They're clearly there just because they add to the album as a whole, which I think is the best part of, you know, the, you know, one of the best parts of the project, to be honest. That the guest features are so, you know, I guess additive, if that's a word. They, they add a lot to the album is what I'm trying to get at. And the beat selection here as well goes for, once again, a more alternative kind of hip-hop style that I really enjoy. Uh, and it kind of goes well nicely with that whole written at night concept as well. Like a lot of these beats, not necessarily that they sound like sleepy in the sense that they kind of put you to sleep or something like that, but they just have a very like night feel to them, if that makes any sense. Sort of a sleepy, almost a sleep deprived type person who once again, kind of going back to that idea I had about, you know, all these thoughts going through someone's head at night or something like that. That's kind of what the beats feel like, uh, you know, when connected to the lyrics and the delivery and things of that sort. Overall, I have to say this is a very enjoyable album. It's definitely an album that I kind of regret not giving a full album review to because it is, you know, probably one of the project, one of the uh, one of the stronger projects I've heard this year. It's overall a very solid hip hop album, and if you like underground hip hop, alternative hip hop, things of that sort, and you like a good concept album, or if you just want to hear an album that uses a lot of guest features in a very interesting and appropriate manner, make sure you give this album a listen because it's definitely going to, you know, hit all that criteria. Alright guys, now we're talking about the new Neck Deep album, The Peace and the Panic. Now this album, and just Neck Deep really in general, I have to say, are one of the newer pop punk bands out there that I do find myself enjoying. Typically, I'm not a big fan of the newer wave of pop punk, mostly just because I don't find it super interesting. 
and I just really feel like it retreads the same ground that lots of pop punk bands in the past have already done. However, Neck Deep, I don't feel like is one of those bands for the most part, and I've been able to enjoy a lot of their previous efforts, especially their last last album that they released, Life That's Not Out To Get You. I really enjoyed that album back when it was released. I thought it was a really solid pop punk album coming out of this decade, out of this newer wave of pop punk bands that I typically don't enjoy all that much. Uh, so here with this new album, I was kind of interested to see where Neck Deep were going to go with this, were they going to have a good follow-up, or were they going to kind of fall into like the trap of releasing a typical sort of modern pop punk album. And honestly, I think they kind of uh, got somewhere in between that, to be completely honest. I'm not a big fan of this album, or at least not as big a fan of it as I was, uh, as Life It's Not Out To Get You. I still think that this is a good album overall. However, there's just some moments on this project that I don't think are quite as good. There's just some tracks I don't think are quite as standout, and there's also some tracks that are just kind of boring overall. You have some very solid pop-punk songs on this uh, album, such as the opening track, Motion Sickness, or the song The Grand Delusion, uh, amongst others here, that are just some really solid uh, pop-punk songs that I think work rather well. You also have some interesting sort of experiments in here as well. Take the track Parachute, for example, which I feel leans more towards alternative rock, just a more typical alternative rock sound, that is. And I think it managed to pull it off uh, decently well. Uh, you also have the track 1970-something, which I think just tells a very interesting story, which has to do with, I believe, uh, their vocalist uh, father and his death. I just really like the storytelling here on this track, and uh, just for the lyrics alone, this track easily stands out as being probably my favorite on the album overall. Uh, it definitely is a very good track if you want to check it out. However, there's also some songs here on this album that I don't think managed to you know stick the landing quite as well. Uh, you have tracks like In Bloom, for example, uh, which I just feel like I, I do enjoy aspects of this track. However, I just think the popular aspects of the song, like I don't think like the mixture between the popular aspects and the heavier like pop punk aspects I don't think was uh, done quite as well in my opinion. I feel like they should have either uh, stuck to the more typical pop punk or gone a lot further into the popular sounding uh, sound because there's just some elements of this track where it feels a bit uneven overall. It's not necessarily that I hate the song, it's just kind of uneven all the way through. And you also have tracks like Wish You Were Here which just kind of feels like a typical sort of you know pop punk slow whiny anthem type track. Uh, to be honest, I, that's the thing about modern pop punk, a lot of it just sounds whiny and you have tracks like this and once again this track just kind of stands out as being one of those songs here on this album. Uh, yeah, I mean there's just a couple of tracks I'm really not a big fan of uh, and the rest of the album overall, it is an enjoyable pop punk album. If you like pop punk, uh, especially modern pop punk, I think you'll enjoy this album. However, if you're not a big fan of the genre, there's no reason why this album is going to change your mind really overall. There are some standout tracks like I mentioned before, Parachute. Uh, Don't Wait, uh, which is another good one that features Sam Carter, uh, I like the aggression on that track, or even 1970-something, which is another great song. There's some standouts, but overall, it's just kind of eh, in my opinion. Alright folks, now we're talking about the newest album from Kesha, entitled Rainbow. Now when it comes to Kesha, to be completely honest, I was never a fan of her or any of her previous works, to be honest. I remember back when she kind of first came onto the musical scene and she was just like the exact opposite of what I was like interested in at the time. I didn't like her music at all and you know that that's really it to be honest. I, I still don't really get the hype behind it. I know she does have a lot of fans and people that are fans of that older I guess era of her music and you know to this day I still really don't get it to be honest but I, I really don't care overall. Uh, but going into this album, the reason I decided to check it out, honestly, was just because, once again, I saw lots of people out there giving it praise, uh, things of that sort, as well as just, uh, just some of the recent issues that were going on in her life concerning that whole legal battle she had with her uh, producer, I believe it was, and all of that unfortunate stuff that was happening to her. I, I was curious to see what she was going to be making after that kind of big event in her life, and, you know, of course, the positive reviews I was hearing from other people got me interested, decided to check it out, and actually ended up rather enjoying this album overall. And it's definitely a, a big step up from her previous works, in my opinion. Once again, I've never listened to any of her previous works in full, just like singles I've heard uh, just around and stuff. Uh, but this is definitely an album I can find myself uh, getting behind. I like the mixture of sounds that she has here on this album. She kind of manages to combine uh, a pop sensibility to genres like rock music or even like country at times. And I'm not a country fan at all, really. But when she manages to kind of incorporate some country elements into the songs here, I think she manages to pull them off rather well. And she even does country better than most modern country artists, I feel, which I think is kind of funny, but, you know, I guess it is what it is. And while the wide array of different sounds that she incorporates here onto this album could definitely make the album experience feel kind of disjointed and all over the place, it's kind of a, a fun all over the place, because you get a wide variety of just sounds and things 
uh, going on kind of this project. Take the track Let Em Talk, for example, which features the Eagles of Death Metal, a uh, band that I am a fan of. Uh, they appear on two tracks here, but Let Em Talk was the first one uh, that you hear in the track listing, and definitely is a standout in my opinion. I think Kesha could really do like a rock type song, in my opinion. She really wants to. She she could definitely sing, to be honest, which I could, didn't know she could do with all the auto tune on her voice in her, like her previous works. But she could definitely sing, and this track just kind of really proves that, as well as many of the other ones here as well. And kind of what I was talking about earlier with that whole uh, legal thing that was going on in her life, and just how that would affect the lyrics here on this project, it definitely does on a lot of the tracks here. And I think that she manages to bring a very introspective uh, side of her here on this album, just with some of the tracks here and just some of the lyrical topics she she decides to cover as well as having a lot of fun on some other tracks, like Let Him Talk, for example, or just some other ones, like Godzilla, where she's talking like about just dating Godzilla. It's kind of silly, but at the same time, you know, it is fun for what it is. She is able to have fun and have less serious subject matter on some of these tracks, while still having the songs themselves be like creative and have like an identity of their own. They're not like typical pop songs or anything like that. And that's the thing I really enjoy about this album. It's, you know, definitely a, a more mature effort from her. It definitely sees her kind of... Uh, just overall stepping into some newer territory and experimenting with some newer sounds and as a result I think she manages to kind of reap the benefits of having all of this you know new sounds going on in this album and just having a more mature outlook in the lyrics here on this album while still having a ton of fun and still having some popular aspects in there it definitely still is a pop album through and through but it's definitely more advanced more enjoyable and just overall a lot more fun than a lot of other modern pop albums Alright guys, now we're talking about the new EP from Injury Reserve, Drive It Like It's Stolen. And overall I have to say that this is a pretty solid EP uh, all around. Uh, there are some tracks I'm not a super big fan of, like the opening track, Ten Tents, or uh, even just tracks later on. Like kind of The closing track I do enjoy, but I don't really like how it kind of ends on sort of an extended fade out uh, that begins a bit, or you know, just a bit too early really in my opinion. But I do, I do enjoy the track overall. Uh, I do like how on this EP there's kind of a nice mix of some tracks that go a bit harder, uh, like See You Sweat or Boom X3, Boom Times 3, however you're supposed to say it. Uh, you have some more lyrical tracks as well, like North Pole, Colors, uh, the beforehand mentioned Chin Up is all, the closing track that is, is another good track as well, uh, like I mentioned before. Overall, yeah, this isn't like the greatest product that Injury Reserve has put out in my opinion, but overall I think it's a pretty solid EP, and if you're a fan of this group, you're going to find something that you enjoy here on this project. Uh, if you're just a hip-hop fan who's looking for something new, uh, there, there are some great tracks here on this album that you should definitely check out. Overall, yeah, I would have to recommend this project. Probably not the greatest thing that they've put out so far, but still pretty good in my opinion. Alright, now we're reviewing the new album from Kalela, Take Me Apart. Uh, now, this was an artist that I really, you know, discovered through some features on, you know, the newest Gorillaz album, um, and as well as a new Danny Brown album that came out last year, Atrocity Exhibition. Uh, her features on both of those projects I enjoyed, so I decided to check out her full-length album when it dropped. And overall, I'd have to say, this is a pretty solid R&B uh, album. I like a lot of the cuts on here. They have a very, you know, very kind of slick, um, just, you know, feel to them that I enjoy. Um, if there's any complaint I really have, it's just that the album at times feels like it's dragging a bit. Maybe it could have been helped by being a little bit shorter. Not, you know, it's not a significant problem or anything. I don't really think that there's any cuts on here that are significantly worse than any of the others. Uh, but overall, yeah, I'd have to say it's just a pretty solid R&B album uh, that was released this year. Um, lots of cuts on here that I find myself enjoying and coming back to. Uh, but yeah, maybe it could just be a little bit shorter. That's really my only complaint. Alright everyone, now we're talking about the newest album from Trivium, The Sin in the Sentence. Now this is a band that I had always heard stuff about, but I didn't really start getting into until, you know, a couple of months uh, prior to this album's release, ever since I heard that they were coming out with a new album. I thought it was about time maybe I get into this band, so I started listening to them and stuff, which is why I decided really not to do a full review of this album, just because I'm not super familiar with this band uh, and stuff. Uh, though I do like their material, and listening to this album through, I think it's a pretty good album. It's a pretty solid project. Honestly, I do like a lot of the tracks that they put here on this thing. I don't think all of them are the most memorable, uh, but the ones that are memorable do really stick out. Uh, 
they do manage to have that very aggressive edge at times, the very, um, I guess, metalcore uh, edge, uh, but then kind of go into the more melodic choruses and things of that sort. On tracks, uh, for example, on tracks like Beyond Oblivion, which just has a very, you know, explosive, uh, kind of massive and very powerful chorus to it that just gets stuck in my head. Uh, it's been stuck in my head since I started listening to this album, and it just hasn't stopped uh, occupying the, this, this space right there. I think you have tracks like the title track um, that are, is just very multifaceted. It has a lot of stuff going on it that I really enjoy. Uh, you have tracks like Endless Nights, which I heard some people don't particularly like because it is a bit more on the softer side, I guess you could say. Or not really softer, I guess it just has more clean vocals, things of that sort. So I do kind of like how it changes things up and goes for that uh, direction here on the project. And you have tracks, of course, like Thrown Into the Fire at the End, which is just a very solid closer to this project. Overall, uh, like I said, this is a pretty great album. Um, I enjoy a lot of the tracks here. Some of them aren't the most memorable, like I said before, but the ones that do really stick out do really manage to stick that stick out. Uh, so you should probably give this album a listen if you haven't done so already. If you're a fan of Trivium, if you're a fan of you know metalcore, melodic metalcore, thrash metal, things of that sort, you're gonna really like this project because there are a lot of really memorable and enjoyable cuts on it. Alright, now we're talking about the newest EP from Creeper, a Christmas-themed EP entitled Christmas, appropriately, I guess. Uh, Creeper are kind of a newer pop-punk band. I actually reviewed their new debut album, Eternity in Your Arms, on my channel in a full review earlier this year, uh, so I recommend you check that out. I thought it was a pretty good album, probably one of my favorite pro projects of the year, I'd have to say. Oh, it was a good album. Uh, so this EP here, um, it's Christmas themed, and I'm going to be completely honest with you people, uh, I'm not a big fan of Christmas music as a whole. I, I, know, I know that's an unpopular opinion to have. Uh, it's nothing to do with the holiday itself. I actually like Christmas when it comes to just, you know, the holiday itself and stuff. Uh, I like Christmas movies and stuff, but just not Christmas music. It just doesn't really do much for me. And just with how much it's played everywhere, it, I, I've just grown to be annoyed by it by this point in my life, uh, and I, I know it's an unpopular opinion to have. Uh, so for that reason, I, I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to expect from this EP, because I, I like Creeper, like I said before. I thought their, their debut album earlier this year was very good, uh, but I don't, I'm not exactly a big fan of Christmas music. Uh, so I'd have to say that I actually enjoyed this EP a bit more than I would have expected, given that I think that Creeper managed to combine Christmassy songs with their sound fairly nicely. Um, there's one track on here that's an original song, and then the two other ones are covers. Uh, the, I like the original song the most, the first song. Uh, it's probably the one that I, just, I feel like has the most going on for it, the one I enjoy the most. The covers are kind of, you know, I could really give or take, I guess you could say. Uh, but overall, I do like how Creeper, you know, I do like their sound, and they do bring that here on this project. Uh, so I do like that, but once again, the many of the aspects I don't like about Christmas music, like just lyrics that you know, or kind of Christmas theme, I'm just sick of them at this point in my life, uh, that are, are of course here because it's a Christmas EP, uh, you, know, what the, you know, I'm not exactly on board a ton with them, I don't, they don't really do much for me, so overall I guess I would say that I enjoy this EP, it's not bad by any means, if you love Creeper and you love Christmas, you're probably going to eat this up because it's right up your alley, uh, but if, if you don't like Christmas music or you don't like Creeper's music, I'm not exactly sure if it's going to do much for you, to be completely honest, but I did enjoy it a bit more than I would have expected. So, you know, there is that to it. And that was it, folks. Those were uh, the other, you know, projects this year that were released that I didn't give a, a full review to. Uh, for whatever reason, like I said before, like I kind of mentioned before, it doesn't necessarily mean that the album was particularly bad or, you know, or anything like that. It just means that for whatever reason, you know, I, I couldn't get around to reviewing it. Um, and, of course, some of these projects I do really enjoy, some of them I didn't really enjoy. Uh, but, you know, your end lists are coming right up after this video drops, so, you know, stick around for those if you want to find out if any of these, you know, get onto any of those lists. Uh, thank you for guys for watching. If you enjoyed this review, or these reviews, rather, uh, make sure you leave a like and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on future album reviews or other music-related content here on the channel. Like I said, your end lists are coming up soon. Uh, in fact, hopefully... Uh, within a couple days after this video drops, so make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on those. Comment down below your thoughts on any of these projects I've mentioned here today in this video. Uh, thank you for watching, guys, and stay golden.